The Florida Gators have some elite defensive talent on campus this weekend. We're going to talk about it here with Brian Smith on Locked On Gators. You are Locked On Gators, your daily podcast on the Florida Gators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Joining me now for Locked On Gators is Brian Smith, Locked On's recruiting insider. And Brian, we're starting off talking about Miles Graham because, I mean, this, this whole episode's about this weekend's visits, defensive players. Miles Graham, obviously, the, the commit, the highest ranked player coming to campus this week. And I don't think we've ever had this conversation. What kind of player do you think Miles Graham is? Instinctive. Um, the bloodlines help. <laughs> obviously uh, his dad could play uh, instinctive and a kid that could probably play multiple spots. Um, as a general rule, I like to see kids 225, 230 to play inside linebacker at the sec level, regardless of what year they are. He's not listed at that, but he has plenty of time to get to that range before he enrolls. I mean, that'll be about a year from now that he enrolls at Florida for summer semester in 2024. Yeah. Gaining 10 pounds in a year is not real hard for a teenager. So I'm not concerned about that. What I am concerned about is how much he picks up the playbook. What they want to throw at a linebacker changes how much he plays, where he plays, what he has to do with special teams. It is about the physical ability for most people because they just watch the film. But whether or not you get on the field as a backer is that playbook, knowing the film and knowing all the tendencies, because they're going to try to put him in bad spots. You know, somebody like Lane Kiffin or Kirby Smart or whatever sees a freshman on the field they're going to go at it, but he has the talent to do it. He can run and he can hit and he is pretty darn instinctive. I just hope he's ready for the uh, playbook because otherwise, you know, there's no reason he wouldn't play early for the Gators. Yeah. There's a, uh, there was a video going around like last week on like coaches Twitter. That was an RPO and like a glance over the middle. And they were just like playing linebacker in college football is the hardest thing to do, especially because linemen can go further downfield so they can sell the run further and it just makes it so difficult. So if your IQ yeah. is not there, oof. it's 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 hard. Like for for reference, technically the NFL allows one yard. They don't really if you if they held it to that every single play, the scoring would go down, and NFL officials at the top that don't like it would get mad. But it, it's really a, a huge difference. If you can act like you're going to run block and you're past the defensive tackle. The linebacker has to come down, and that's where this stuff gets really awkward. I, I've had multiple linebacker coaches, D-line coaches, tell me I need my linebacker to physically be in more than one spot at the same time. And he goes, I'm not kidding. Yeah. Like, he goes, you can't you can't do your responsibilities with RPO, with how it's set up based on the three-yard rule. But that's also why getting a kid like Graham that's naturally instinctive is important. Part of this is gut. You're going to get beat sometimes on <laughs> RPO games. And there is not a darn thing a defensive coach can do about it. They all hate it, by the way. I've had plenty of those conversations with defensive coaches. But it's not going away because it sells tickets. Fans want to see points. And when yep. there's points scored, more tickets are sold. Advertising goes – so it's here to stay. But if Graham can come in and play early, it wouldn't surprise me. And as you know, you're a Florida fan. They need front seven help anyway. I think Graham's going to do well long term. I'm just not sure how much he'll play as, as – most people know being an SEC linebacker is hard enough. Doing it as a freshman is really hard. Yeah, I mean, especially when we talk about how just difficult in general it is to play linebacker in the SEC. Absolutely. How much more difficult does that make it that Florida under Austin under uh, Austin Armstrong, they're going to ask you to cover, defend the run, and you're going to be used as a pass rusher. Last year, uh Austin Armstrong's two off-ball linebackers at Southern Miss rushed the passer. It was 19 and 17.5% of the time. So you're going, you're basically a, another pass rusher as well. So how much more difficult does that make it? Well, you're digging right into the thing that I talked about earlier in this segment, and that's playbook. He can't put you in the game unless you know all the calls. And that those are dirty, dirty words because coaches don't like to tell young guys this, but you're not going to play unless you know the playbook. But they, they're not going to tell them that in recruiting because that's a negative, but it's, it, this is an old axiom that I've said for years. Coaches are the most stubborn people on planet earth. They want everybody to know their full scheme. It's not realistic. 
So you got to use packages for these guys coming in. Now, Graham, again, he plays at Woodward Academy in Atlanta. It's a good program. He's been well coached. He's from the right bloodlines. He has an advantage or two that others don't. I get that. But if they really want him or any other freshman linebacker to make a lot of impact, they got to concentrate on something and let him get good at it and then move on. I've heard too many stories about situations like this. Well, we know we got a guy coming in. Well, we're in all these positions. No, that's not how it works. They're going to be swimming and they're just going to fail. Uh, I've heard a lot of those stories and I see a lot of those guys get fired later on. So as a junior and senior, yeah, he can probably do that. But that's, again, that's part of the process. You got that. And that's why you got to recruit every year at a high level. So you don't put a Miles Graham in that spot. It's, it's not fair. Yeah. And I mean, you mentioned earlier, Miles Graham, you think is someone who can maybe play multiple spots. That sure. that seems to be the trend with Florida at linebacker, at least. You That's a good thing, man. A good yeah, thing. a Darius Hayes can do it. They're yeah. in on Chris Jones, who we were like, yeah, he can do. It. So, what what do you kind of think about Florida going for those players? They're not really going for someone who fits in a box. They're just like, you know, we're gonna find multiple spots for you and just be just be multiple. It's the only option left because when a team, this is something I use almost every podcast or anybody I talk to in football. To put it in perspective, how hard it is for Armstrong or any coach. The following scenario plays out constantly. You're going up against a team that has some pretty good tight ends. They come out in 22 personnel, which means two running backs, two tight ends. Okay, they're going to they're going to play power football. Are they? First down, they come out two tight ends on each side of the tackles, power football. Same group the next play. They're in four wide with one running back. Both the tight ends split out. If your linebackers can't cover as well as they play the run, you are in a world of hurt because it's going to be first and ten. They're not even going to get to third downs. So you've got to have guys, like you said, that are multiple. If you do not, you get smoked, especially in the SEC. Have you noticed how good Georgia's tight ends are? Have you seen the big receivers at Ole Miss and at, at LSU? and Alabama? You have to be multiple. It's hard enough guarding their traditional guys. And then you add these tight ends now in the running game and the screen game. It – You've got to have linebackers that can do everything. It is arguably the most difficult position to project now on defense because you don't know. It's all about above the shoulder, kind of like quarterback recruiting. The kids can't pick up the scheme. I don't care. Like a Darius Hayes is one of my favorite players, regardless of position or state in the country. But if he doesn't pick up scheme, the only thing he's going to be able to play is edge rusher. And he's not going to be able to play any off ball linebacker because that's a lot more responsibility. So it's it's hard, man, but they have to recruit that way, and it's smart by Armstrong to do it. Yeah, and I say even if you can't pick up scheme, I don't know how much edge rusher you could play in a defense that asks their edges to drop into coverage ten percent of the time either. So it can get yeah. dicey. It, that's yeah. it is what it is, man, and that's why you see so many busts, guys running free. It only takes one guy in a defense to miss, and it's a forty yard putt. It's freaking hard. So college football's gotten a lot more complex. Today's episode of Lockdown Gators is brought to you by the best shorts known to man, bird dogs. You can swim, cook, play basketball, lift. Um, let me tell you, I know it's skies out, thighs out. But when you got these bird dogs on and you do leg day, them thighs looking solid in them, let me tell you. Go to birddogs.com slash lockdown college, enter promo code Locked on college, you'll get free custom bird dogs, Yeti style tumbler with every order, but also you'll get a five star shorts wearing experience with bird dogs. Speaking of a, a position where if you screw up, there could be a 40 yard play. We got some safeties to talk about here. Uh, yes. And Zay Mincy is the first one. Zay Mincy is someone that Florida fans been talking about a lot, very excited for the possibility of him being a Gator. What do you think of Zay Mincy as a player? He's played corner for most of his career at Mainland. I've seen him for a couple of years and he's at least six, two. So most, you know, you see all these guys listed at certain heights. He might be six, three, and I think he'll end up at safety, but he can turn and run unlike most guys with his height. So even if it's just occasional, you could drop him in the box and he could play over the slot, or maybe he could play boundary. If you're going to run cover three, you could play corner. And even if it's in the deep secondary, he covers like one. The only question with him is what do you want to put on his plate? Again, this is about scheme. This is about learning the playbook. Safety is not friendly for a freshman, especially in today's world. They try to attack those kids 
and put him in bad spots with RPOs, et cetera. But he is an exceptionally smart young man. Been around him several times. He's he's not your normal kid out of the state of Florida. He he could fit in anywhere academically. So look for him to be an opportunist in, in wherever he goes. And I think it'll be one of the big three in the state of Florida. Wherever he goes, I expect Mincy to play and play pretty early. He's a smart guy, man. He's a lot of fun to talk to. One of my one of my favorite interviews in the state, to be quite honest. So can't teach the size though, brother. And that's why he got all the offers, and that's why he's continued to be such a highly recruited prospect. How important would it be for Florida to add Mincy to a class that already includes Xavier Filsimi, uh, Josiah Davis at safety, and so far, not a corner? Well, it gives you some flexibility because the other spot we talked about linebacker and extension of that, and it's I had a long conversation with the defensive coordinator last year about this, talking about the RPO game and all the different things you do with the slot position. If you don't have a multiple guy that's a physical run defender but can cover in space at the slot, you're, you're it's going to be a long afternoon. You can play the most run-oriented team in college football. They only got to run a couple of slot screens or whatever, and they can kill you. But, of course, most teams run a bunch of it. <laughs> Kids like the ones they have committed already plus Mincy – Gives you different options on who you would put as the nickel or the line, you know, the hybrid line, whatever you want to call it. Mincy's going to end up at like 210, something like that. He could be called a line. It doesn't really matter. It is a jack of all trades position that we're seeing in college football now. He's the perfect guy for that, but that doesn't mean that the other guys couldn't do it too. If you look at the kids that Corey Raymond and everybody's recruiting, it doesn't matter the school. If you don't have length, they probably don't want you unless you're a 4 3 guy. Then it doesn't matter. They'll take you anyway. I think it's great for Florida to do that because when I was growing up, when Florida, like under Spurrier, under Meyer, et cetera, they always had safeties that made big plays, man. And they had the range, they had the speed. And I know that's one of the reasons you're a Gator fan. So they need more of that. And they're doing a hell of a job recruiting right now. I think they're absolutely on the right track. And you can make the argument they're doing a better job in the deep secondary than any other, any other spot. So good for them. Yeah. Uh, one of the reasons I'm a Florida Gators fan and one of the reasons I played safety is because I was like, all right, Gators, good job. Um, but on, on the topic of versatile defensive backs, Justin Denson's another one where he calls himself the Slim Reaper here. And I know that depending, on, funny, man, I depending saw. on where you look, he's a safety <laughs> or he's the corner. What do you think? What kind of player do you think he is in long term? Where do you think he kind of slots in? I was arguing with myself about that, watching his film, as goofy as that sounds. Any of the following three are legitimate options for him at the Power 5 level. Receiver, corner, or free safety. I actually liked him best at receiver, but it's just a gazillion times harder to get DBs because nobody wants to play it. That's the thing. Like, if you ask 10 guys that can play either side, 9 out of 10 are going to say receiver. It's just a numbers game. It's more fun to get the ball, and that's what Sports Center focuses on more often than not. That being stated... If they're going to play some zone coverage, especially, I'd love him at corner as a bit kind of like Mincy. Mincy could play in a cover three scheme as a as a zone corner. This kid, I think, is twitchy, if not twitchier than Mincy. No, he's not quite as tall, but he's got great hands, catches the ball. That's that's why I liked him at receiver. I think he's one of those kids you bring in. And you, you always try kids at corner first because it's the biggest elephant in the room. There's never enough of them. Even LSU and Florida and Ohio State, some of these schools that go by DBU can always use another corner because you got to rotate him in, et cetera. He could play that. So I think that's where they'll start him at, and that's where I would too because, again, you just need them. But if he doesn't work out there, that gives you another option, another chess piece at free safety. And if that doesn't work out, move him to offense. He's got really good hands and he's explosive. So great prospect. It's just random being where he's from. And I, I looked him up and I'm like – Oh, yeah, I remember watching this kid a couple months ago. But think about it this way. How often does Florida recruit a kid from the East Coast? You know, they don't have to leave the South to get – that tells you something right off the bat. When I saw that, I'm like, I remember this kid. He's got offers from Notre Dame and different schools all over the country. It's just – it's hilarious watching his film because he's dominating with where he's playing, and he should. But he, I just wonder – the only thing I worry about is going to the SEC – that's you talk about an uptick in, in the competition. I mean, he completely dominates where he's at now, but that'll change when he walks into the swamp if that's where he decides to play. 
And I mean, you mentioned it with both Zay Mincy and Justin Denson playing cover three, like, oh, like they could both play corner in that kind of defense. That's Austin Armstrong's most played coverage at Southern Miss. Is that, do you think that's an advantage at all for Florida in the recruiting trail where you can be like, oh, like, well, we play cover three, so you could play corner for us. And and that's kind of the, the more glamorous position as opposed to safety, or, or do you think that's just. It irrelevant? depends on the kid. That That's a really good question, to be honest with you, Brandon. There, Certain guys that this is something I talk about with some of my brethren on the recruiting trail, all the recruiting analysts, we go to the same spots all the time. Okay. We all know each other. We talk to each other about, Hey, how's your family? Like we know each other. It's like a family ourselves. And one of the things we talk about when you see a kid, that's a quote unquote two way player, how they literally, I'm not kidding on this, how they walk around, how they carry themselves. I can almost tell you before I see a play, whether it's an offensive or defensive player. Defensive guys have a different kind of attitude, a different chip on their shoulder, especially down here in Florida. There's a lot of attitude. And it's one of the reasons that the big three in Florida has always turned out so many NFL draft picks. you got to be a different cat to play corner. Okay? And and in cover three, you're going to get beat quite often. That gives up a lot of underneath stuff. you got to have a different attitude. But when you have the opportunity to make that play, and this is why the defense has been around forever, and Saban likes it too, that kind of puts things in perspective. (laughs) you can make that play and change a game. You don't give up the big play, but if you're smart and you understand and you learn the scheme, you can make a ton of plays out of cover three. And it's good against the run too. I think it's an advantage, but it takes a kid to understand scheme. And and you'll hear guys say, I'm a man corner. Nobody's a man corner anymore because everybody runs bunch formations constantly. You can't just run man. It doesn't work. You just get picked to death. Yeah. Rub route, whatever. It's a pick. (laughs) <laughs> so it's uh, we talk about that all the time. If an NFL show is on, the receivers talking about it, it's a rub route. If it's a DB talking about it, it's a pick. But anyway, the bottom line is you have to be able to play multiple. And this is a formation that you can run. A cover three you can change quickly into cover one. You can drop a rat in the hole, as Saban likes to talk about the safety blitzes. You've got to be able to run that. It's a it's an NFL style defense. It should be a benefit. And I think that the kind of kids they're recruiting, they're all over six foot. We've talked about this several times. And if you're going to play against Georgia and compete, that's, that's the goal. You've got to get better at corner and you've got to get better on your defense in general. This is a great way to do it. I love what they're doing in the secondary in general. And I mean, now moving away from the secondary, going to the front four, a couple names, just Malik Blockton is the first one. What kind of interior defensive lineman, or if you think he's better on the edge, um, what kind of lineman do you think he is? He's unique. I wouldn't call him quote unquote twitchy, but there were times on his film where he would come off the edge and play power and then translate it to speed. Once he gets into a guy, he's 250, 260, something like that. Once he gets into a tackle, he did a pretty good job of holding the edge and chasing down guys. But his biggest attribute, and especially long term, is power playing inside. And when he went against guards and he slanted or took an angle, not many offensive guards. Hand, I mean, he's playing in high school just outside of Montgomery, Montgomery Alabama. And that, that's an area that's loaded with talent, but he ate him up. Once he adds another 20, 25 pounds, I think he's going to be the prototypical three technique that you see across the Southeastern Conference. And that's why everybody wants it. Uh, Pike Road High School, where he's at, is always loaded. It's nothing new. So I'm curious to see, because that is right now, Auburn is making a major push to keep those kids home. Montgomery is their kind of their home city. It's an hour away. Maybe that's going to be hard. And he's got an Auburn visit in the season. That makes me nervous, but Auburn might also be terrible this year. I mean, it's the first year. I know he's a really good coach. This is an interesting recruitment to kind of test Florida. They got one of their best players in the last class was out of Alabama. And they, I mean, you got to give Napier credit. He's coached in that state. He knows that state. This is a chance to kind of see a litmus test. You're not going to beat the Alabamas and Georgias unless you get those kind of players. And you're trying to take one out of Auburn's backyard. This is interesting. So I hope they can get him because this is what we need in the SEC. We need more competition anyway. Yeah, and I mean, this is an SEC battle. It seems like the public perception favorites here are Auburn, Texas is in there, and and he's got the Florida visit set up. But how would Florida separate themselves? Because you can't go, well, we're the SEC, like as if you're going in, you know, uh, even like, Florida State, Miami, UCF, that's the thing you have over them is getting to say we're the SEC. You can't say that when it's Auburn and Texas here. 
I would say the biggest thing is just look at it from a perspective of this is what we're going to do. You just got to show your plan. And they do need to play better this year. They weren't good enough in big moments last year. Year two, year three, as you move along in a system, you get better. You have to show improvement, especially, again, Auburn has the last visit as it stands now. So let's see how well they do with this visit, and then let's kind of move forward. But they need to set the tone coming up here in this weekend. Yeah, and another guy we have in that front four is Jalen Harvey, who we'll get to that in a second. But, but what kind of player do you think he is? Harvey can be many things. Again, we're talking about multiple edge. He could blitz. He could play linebacker. He could do different things. Um, he kind of fits the role of the guy that just makes plays. He's a football player first. I know that's a really overused term, but that's also why teams like Alabama, Penn State, Notre Dame, Florida, everybody at least scouted him if not offered him. And he's playing in an area that has a lot of talent. He's in Maryland. So I think he can play in the SEC and play fairly early. Where you want to play him depends on how you load up your front seven. Are you more of a 4-3 team or a 3-4 team? That will, as they say, take care of itself. I just know he can play. Uh, I would probably look at him as an outside linebacker first and just figure it out depending on how big he gets. But he can run and he makes plays in the backfield. I'll take all of those you want to give me every day of the week. Yeah, and uh, we were talking about this a little bit before recording, but Florida – was supposed to have him <laughs> this weekend. Uh, heavy Penn State lean. I, I know you were saying off air. They're like, oh, like, well, apparently visits are getting canceled. So uh, as a Florida fan, y- you got to not feel too good about that one, right? There's, there's two things with this. In today's era, kids commit all the time, and then suddenly they change their mind and they take visits. You don't you don't stop recruiting the kid. I mean, what? You're getting paid the same salary and you're spending their money to send your coaches out there. Who cares? Just keep recruiting them. If Florida starts off good this year, if they beat Utah or something, they're going to get kids to visit. You just have to keep knocking on the tree, man, and it eventually goes down. So Florida has to get some of these kids that they're not favored to get if they're going to get over the top. That theme will care. You will hear me say that every week on your show. There's going to be, they got to beat Georgia for a kid. They got to beat Penn State for it. Sometimes you got to go in somebody else's backyard and just win the recruiting battle. Here's a great example of that Penn State gets a ton of kids from Baltimore and Washington, D.C. They have since before Paterno was even there. It's not going to change. It's closer. I get it. But that doesn't mean Florida doesn't have a lot to sell. It's a great school. It's got tradition. It's in the SEC. It's not real hard to sell UF. So you just keep recruiting the guy. All right. Thank you so much, Brian. This is Brian Smith, Locked On's Recruiting Insider. Catch him all throughout the Locked On College channel and twice this week on Locked On Gators. Thank you, sir. Thanks for making Locked On Gators your first listen of the day. Every day we are available daily and free wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll be back tomorrow to talk more Florida Gators football with Brian Smith, talking offensive recruits there for Locked On Gators. I'm Brandon Olson. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at WNS underscore Brandon. Find all my written work with Whole Nine Sports, Giants, Country, NFL 33. I'll see you all tomorrow.